your conversion as a couple to the cause of international women's rights came after Tiananmen Square when you realized the sheer numbers of crimes against women that went unremarked upon. Cheryl, can you talk about that? Yeah, actually, when we were in Tiananmen Square, we were amazed at how much attention uh, the uh, crackdown got. And, of course, it's terrible. You lived in China. You were covering China at the time, Absolutely. We we were there, and it was stunning to us. I mean, it's terrible that kids were killed, and we still, you know, were horrified by it. We knew some of them. Uh, But what we found... uh, The following year is when we started roaming the countryside and digging deeply into some of the issues there. We discovered that, in fact, there were many, many millions of missing girls uh, in China, partly because of, you know, female infanticide, but also because of sex-selective abortion. Uh, Families were discovering that the sonogram was able to let them tell, you know, tell, oh, we don't want a girl, so let's abort her before she's even born. And that was happening so that there were basically 30 million missing girls Hmm. from the population. How early can a sonogram tell you that? Do you know? Uh, You know, up until certainly the end of the first early second trimester, um, we don't really know exactly when these abortions throughout the term were taking place, Mm -hmm. but they were taking place on a mass level. And Nick, you liken the cause of women's rights to fighting slavery and totalitarianism and say it's the cause of this century. With the Civil War and Cold War, there were heavy costs to those battles. Do you accept the same in this, uh, expect the same in this struggle? No. I mean, we can, this is a war we can fight uh, with many fewer losses. And, and the, the British really led the fight against slavery, for example. And uh, they paid a significant price for that. They lost uh, 1.6 percentage points of their GNP each year for 60 years. And I really admire them. It was really because of the British that the global slave trade uh, was ended. And this is something that we can do, and it will help fight poverty, help fight extremism, and we won't have to pay a, a huge price. Um, about the, uh, the missing girls, let me dig in on that a little bit more because your book was excerpted in a special edition of the Sunday New York Times magazine. And one of the ar- other articles in that issue pointed to the fact that economic development around the world has not ended the missing girls phenomenon either in India or in China. So is economic development not sufficient to make women matter more? Oh, you're right. This is a long-term process. Economic development certainly helps as uh, households and villages and counties start to see the value that women can bring to their economy. Uh, It takes a long time, Uh, even in China, where this actually, where we first learned about this problem. uh, We've seen enormous economic development there as well. Uh, And I think that the issues are abating uh, in terms of the prejudice against women, but these are century-old uh, habits. I mean, I think the tendency is to think of this as the issue of justice, that uh, you know, there are more women enslaved in brothels now than there were people transferred each year into the, into the slave plantations. But I think maybe the argument that actually gets more traction in a lot of countries is not that it's uh, morally wrong to treat women unfairly, but rather that if you want to develop, if you want to fight poverty, you can't do it if you don't tap the resources of half your population. And China uh, is a remarkable example of a country that went from extreme prejudice against women, extreme constraints where you had you know, uh, foot binding, concubinage, uh, child marriage, to a place where women actually play a major role in the labor force. And that is why China has prospered. And you're running a contest on your New York Times blog asking people to write in with examples of women's empowerment. And one of the early comments starts like this. I live in a third world country. You know it as Detroit. Why doesn't anyone care about poverty and the disproportionate burden it puts on women here at home? Look, these are global issues, and they certainly echo uh, here in the U.S., and we do need to be more concerned uh, with uh, poverty, education, uh, the role of women in the U.S., but there really is a difference. Um, In uh, some countries in in Africa, women has a one-chance-in-seven lifetime risk of dying in childbirth. Uh, In uh, the U.S., if I remember right, it's one, 1 in, in 2,800. 1 in 47,000. Um, oh, 2,800. Anyway. Um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, there are real issues of, of sex trafficking here, um, but India has several million girls who are locked up in brothels. Uh, you know, it, so um, 
we can do more than one thing at the same time, and we certainly need to worry about Detroit, but we at the same time can't forget about girls locked up in brothels in India. Paresa in Hoboken, you're on WNYC. Did I say your name right? Yes, Paresa, how are you? Good, thank you for calling. Thank you, I love your show. Um, I actually am originally from Iran, I was born there. Um, I have a graduate degree here in the States, and most of my cousins are either doctorates or have graduate degrees in Iran and are unable to get jobs along with the rest of the young adult population in Iran, but much more disproportionately compared to the men. And again, more than half of college graduates in Iran are women, and more than half of those enrolled are women as well. And it just goes to show that there is still so much oppression going on in that country. Some of the fighting and the protests that have been going on in the past few months was actually pulled together and organized by women who are fed up with not being able to get the jobs they deserve. Cheryl, do you write about uh, Iran, particularly in the book? Um, We write about a lot of the Muslim countries, and it is a very, very tough issue because in, in addition to Iran and Saudi Arabia, there are these are countries that educate their women. Uh, so clearly education is not enough. Uh, these countries have to accept women into the workforce, into the labor force, and say that they are the most productive members. They can be one of the most productive members of society. And if our countries are going to increase their GDP, Let's turn to some women. That one of the things we don't often talk about is this very widespread perception um, that in Muslim countries, women are second-class citizens. And so that's why we have that chapter. And I think it is important to address. And the answer is sort of complicated. There are some Muslim countries where women indeed really are given opportunities and brought into the labor force. And there's been tremendous improvements. And, um, you know, Bangladesh is an interesting example of that with more girls in high school now than boys. And I think that's one reason why Pakistan today is a lot more – why Bangladesh is much more promising today than Pakistan. Um, But it is true also that if you look at countries where – Uh, Girls and women aren't um, given opportunities and run into a lot of problems than they are disproportionately um, Muslim, conservative Muslim country. This is kind of the dirty little secret of development that uh, isn't talked about very much. But one of the reasons for a lot of the worst suffering is not just really low incomes but also some really bad spending decisions. And those are, uh, frankly, disproportionately by men. If you look at – in the book, we look at how uh, the poorest families all across the world spend their incomes. And uh, on average, they spend about 2 percent of their incomes on education, which is a real positive net economic return. It's a great investment. In contrast, they spend about 20 percent of their incomes on a combination of alcohol, cigarettes, prostitution, sugary drinks, extravagant festivals. And if you could just reduce that 20 percent to, say, 16 percent and take that extra four percentage points and add that to education, that would be utterly transformative. And one way to do that is to put more spending uh, power in the hands of women. And so is that gender related or is it also an indication of a problem with men's roles. If there are no jobs for men, do they seek to escape their worries? Or even if they do have jobs, they're more likely to squander these investment no, funds. Even if, I mean, alas, even if they have jobs, when they do get income, uh, when men control the purse strings, they're more likely to uh, spend incomes in uh, ways that are you know, related to consumption, less to investment, especially investment in children. And so as a preemptive strike, what are you going to say to the 20 posts we're about to get on our website calling you sexist? Um, there is abundant evidence uh, for this uh, and from a wide variety of cultures, uh, from uh, uh, Indonesia, South Africa, uh, Liberia, that when women have uh, more control over the purse strings, then their children grow taller, get more education, um, uh, are less likely to be malnourished. In, in um, I think it's Liberia, there was one good study that where there are men's crops and women's crops, and they're different. And when the men's crops have a good year and the men get more income, more money is spent on beer. When women's crops do well and the women get more spending power, then more money is spent on education.